how does a camera work, the stuff you need to know, and also some more thoughts on the last episode, 11 actionable things you and I can do to improve our photography in 2023, part 2. Hello, hi, welcome to episode 150, no less, of the Photography Explained podcast. I'm your host, Rick, and in each episode, I will try to explain one photographic thing to you in plain English in less than 27 minutes-ish without the irrelevant details. What I tell you is based on my lifetime of photographic experience and not Google. Okay, there was a bit of Google for this one. Um... Because I, <laughs> I, I, my research wasn't too good for the, the first go at this. So uh, this, this one's better anyway. Before I get into that good stuff, here is the answery bit. A camera is a lightproof box with an opening in it. And this opens when the shutter is raised to allow light to pass through to the camera sensor. Or to film, of course. This is what happens when you take a photo. And that is how a camera works. Okay then. Well, that was the answer. Nice and short and sweet, but there is more to it. So in this episode, I will, I'll go into this in a bit more detail. Well, I couldn't go into much less detail, could I? But just enough to help you and I, of course. Okay, so let's get straight into the talky bit. No, let's not. Adlib warning. Well, I'm delighted to have made it to 150 episodes. I never thought this would happen when I started doing my podcast. Well, I didn't think about it, to be honest with you. So so I'm really, really chuffed to get to 150 episodes. And it's great to see that my audience is growing with every episode. So thanks for being with me. I hope you enjoy this episode and I hope you stay with me for lots more good stuff coming up. So in a typically British understated way, that was a celebration for 150 episodes. Now let's move on to... The talky bit. As a wagon drives by because i got the window open because it's a bit warm today. <laughs> I answered this question way back in episode 2, but there's, there's no need to go back to that one as this is a much better answer, honest. And it's much longer because back, back then I was restricting to 10 minutes for some reason which I can't really explain. So where does the word camera come from? Well, this is what I wrote in episode 2. The word camera comes from camera obscura. Obscura is a Latin word that means darkened in English. Camera is also Latin, meaning vault or vaulted room, or room. It also has Greek origins as well. So, camera obscura came into being, and that means dark chamber, or also dark room. So there you have it. Next time you look at your camera, think of it as a dark chamber or a dark room. Now, I'm adding in the dark room bit because with a bit more research, I found a few more interpretations of this very old term and some information which I seem to miss from episode two. Right, so that was then, but there is more. Camera obscure is actually a natural thing that happens when light is projected through a, through a small hole onto, say, a wall. I might even go so much as to say it's a natural phenomenon. I didn't, I didn't write that in my script because I was worried I couldn't say it, but I nailed it. <laughs> And yeah, this is where pinhole camera came from. And the, the pinhole camera is a smaller version of the camera obscura, which back in the day, it was it could have been a room. Yeah, an actual room. Now, I know this is a massive oversimplification of the history of a camera, but the point is this. A camera is a lightproof box with a hole in it. It was hundreds of years ago, and it is today. Same thing. So I'm happy with that. I'm quite happy that I've got the evolution right. If I've missed out everything else in the middle. Sometimes when I'm writing this stuff, I do worry that I'm not explaining things, but I'm quite happy with that. That makes sense to me. Like I say, let's ignore all the bit in the middle. What's the difference between a pinhole camera and a modern camera? Well, in principle, nothing. They are both lightproof boxes with a hole in them that lets light in. And you could apply that logic to your phone, couldn't you? Because that's that's a lightproof box and it's got a hole in it called the lens and there's a something that moves to allow some light in. They're all the same, aren't they? So why a lightproof box? Well, rather than viewing the image on a wall, which is what people used to do with a camera obscura effect, some very clever people worked out that you could record that image by doing some clever stuff with chemistry. No, I'm not going to go into that at all in any way, shape or form. But to do that, you needed to be able to control the amount of light that got through. So you, if you take, <laughs> if you take from, from then to today, that's what your shutter's doing in your camera. Your shutter is controlling the amount of light that hits the sensor. There you go. That's the shortest history of the camera ever, but it makes sense to me. That's how a camera works. So this is how you work with a camera. 
Well, you, you create a composition using the viewfinder, you focus, you apply the settings that you want, and when you press the shutter release button, the camera sensor is exposed to light and the image is recorded on the camera sensor. There you go, that's how a camera works and how to take a photo in one sentence. OK, let's get on to some tricky technical stuff, shall we? How does a camera sensor actually work? Hmm. A camera sensor captures light and converts it into something that becomes a photo. I'm sorry, this is way beyond my comprehension and understanding. Now, I've tried, I've, I've tried at this. I've read various explanations of how a camera sensor works and, and I've concluded I'm not intelligent enough to understand this. But let me add, understanding this, it's not going to help me with my photography. No, no, no. This is a level of complexity and detail far too much for me. So I will stick to my explanation. A camera sensor takes the light that hits it when the shutter is opened and turns it into a photo. That'll do for me. <laughs> and camera film does the same thing using different things and a different chemical process. OK, I think that's enough of that. Let's move on before I get myself into trouble. Talking about how a camera works. So why are they the shape and size that they are? Well, quite simply, this is evolution. And I'm going to do another massive leap in time and technology now. So in the early 1900s, yep, all that time ago, 35mm cameras started to be made. And the SLR camera, single lens reflex, is a direct evolution of a 35mm camera. SLR cameras, which were commonly known as 35mm cameras, used 35mm camera film. The size of the photo recorded on the camera film is 36mm wide by 24mm high. And guess what? The size of a full-frame camera sensor is... 36mm wide by 24mm high. Excuse the dramatic build-up there. So that's where the size of camera sensors today came from. And that's why a camera is the size that it is, because it's all based on the camera sensor, which is the important bit that takes a photo. So everything in a camera is built around the camera sensor, and the size of the camera descends, and the size of the camera sensor determines the size of the camera in very broad terms. Obviously, it depends how much electronics you cram around the thing, but that's why a Micro Four Thirds camera is smaller than a crop sensor camera which is smaller than a full frame camera because the fundamental building block of the camera the sensor is smaller on a micro four thirds than a crop sensor than is on a full frame sensor all makes sense doesn't it which which in photography make, makes a change doesn't it that's one part of why a camera is the shape and size that it is and the other one is well it's us humans isn't it and how we use the camera because we've got to hold the camera we've got to change settings we've got to hold the camera steady we've got to compose a photo we've got to look through a viewfinder or a screen so we've determined the other bits of the camera which which is why they are the shape that they are and which is why it's so bad taking photos with a phone because it's like a slippery eel so okay parts of a camera well it's very easy to assume that people know what all the bits of a camera are but i'm just going to go through them here because i think i think it's helpful and useful Let's start with the viewfinder. This is the thing that you look through to take a photo. Now these days you can also do this using the LCD screen on the back of the camera. Now I'm more of a traditionalist though, so I still use the viewfinder first. But, but to be fair, I do use the LCD screen as well to try and help me in using the live view mode. But to counter that, I'm still using a Canon 6D, which was uh, brought to market in late 2014. So it's hardly got the biggest and brightest LCD screen. Certainly when you compare it to a current phone, I've got an iPhone XS. Again, it's hardly cutting edge, but it's got a massive screen that's dead good to use. So I tend to use the viewfinder rather than the LCD screen. So you've got optical viewfinders, which through mirrors and string and clever stuff, help you to compose a photo by actually looking through the camera lens at what you're looking at. This is where SLRs came from. But you also have electronic viewfinders, which are also known as EVFs. It was obviously too much to ask people to say the actual words electronic viewfinder, so we came up with an acronym for it. Uh, if it's an ac I once got called out for uh, calling something an acronym that wasn't, so I'm <laughs> going to say abbreviation and play safe. Oh, just scratch me watch on me desk. Very good quality recording techniques, Rick. So you'll find an EVF on a mirrorless camera and an optical viewfinder on a DSLR camera. That's the fundamental difference between the two. 
And if you're ever wondering why a camera is called a mirrorless camera, I mean, we never asked for them to put a, ca- a mirror in it, did we? No, because it's the SLR camera has the mirror, and that's the thing that bends the light, so you're looking through the actual lens. Get rid of that sticky-up thing on front of the camera, have an EVF, and, and you're looking at an electronic version of your viewfinder. There you go, mirrorless and SLR cameras explained in three sentences. So they're the same, mirrorless and SLR, or DSLR, the same but different. They're the same as in you press the shutter release button and you take a photo, but the different as in exactly how they do this, which, which isn't important. There are cameras with fixed lenses and there are cameras where you can change the lens. There is an acronym for these cameras, ILCs or Interchangeable Lens Cameras. Now, if you've ever wondered what this term means, wonder no more. It is confusing and does not help us. It means different things to different people and just forget about it. It doesn't help you. I just want you to know what it was so you could not bother with it. So you've got cameras with the lens fixed to the body and that's that. And there are cameras where you can change the lens. Now, most professional and, well, high level or beginner, consumer, most cameras these days, you can change the lenses. So that's what I'm going to go with here. Which means that there are fundamentally two parts to most cameras, the camera body and the lens. The camera body houses all the electronics, the camera sensor, batteries, memory card slots, all the dials and controls and bells and whistles that we need to change the settings to take photos. And the lens contains the optics, and it's the thing that focuses the light on the camera sensor. It does a couple of other things I'll get on to. So, you've got a camera and you've got a lens. How do they attach? Well, you have something called a lens mount. Now, the lens mount is the thing that you attach the lens to the camera body with. Each manufacturer has their own lens mount, so you can't put a Canon lens on a Sony camera. There's probably an adapter you can get these days, but why would you? There is an exception to this, a notable exception. Micro Four Thirds cameras, principally Olympus and Panasonic, they use the same mount, which is a jolly nice idea i have to say and i can't believe i've used the word jolly in my podcast that's the first there are also what are called third-party lens manufacturers and they make lenses for more than one camera system and that's camera lenses done in a nutshell so why why have different lenses well photographers use different camera lenses to take photos of different subjects and in different conditions in different ways and That's an episode all of its own for sure, which I've just added to the list. See, it's the podcast that keeps on giving. There's a thing called a grip on a camera. This is important. The camera grip is, not surprisingly, the bit that you use to hold the camera. Now, as you look at a camera, it's the sticky out bit on the left-hand side, which when you hold the camera to your eye, it's on the right-hand side and you can wrap your fingers around it. Yep, camera manufacturers assume that we're all right-handed. Thankfully, I am. I mean, what do you do if you're left-handed? Use your right hand, I think. Uh, I don't think they do left-handed cameras. Not 100% sure, but pretty sure about that. Now, the grip's very important, as this is what you hold the camera with to take a photo. And when I'm not taking photos of my camera on a tripod, which is normally when I'm on travel stuff, just wandering around, looking at stuff and finding stuff to photograph, I have a wrist strap on my camera And I walk around holding my camera in the grip. And I'll do that all day. So the grip's very important to me. And thankfully on the Canon 6D, the grip is very good. It's very ergonomically well designed. Brave use of the word ergonomic, Rick. Okay, so camera settings. Well, there's an endless, a seemingly endless array of buttons and dials on cameras these days. These, These are the things you use to change the camera settings. Now, don't worry. You don't have to use them all. And you don't have to use all of them all of the time. But there are, there are three main things that you do need to know about, which is important, and they are aperture, shutter, and ISO. These three settings determine if you get a photo that is correctly exposed. Correctly exposed means you have recorded the levels of light in what you are photographing correctly. Now, this is very important. So, in the context of how does the camera work, this is one of those fundamental things. So, what we have this thing called the exposure triangle, which is a combination of those three things. Aperture, shutter, and ISO. So what do they mean? Well, very quickly, aperture. Well, the aperture is in the camera lens and not the camera body for a start. The aperture is the hole that light passes through when the shutter is opened. You can change the size of the aperture, making the opening smaller, letting less light in, or larger, letting more light in. Now, the shutter. The shutter is in the camera body, and the shutter is normally closed, and when opened, exposes the sensor to light. 
The amount of time that the shutter is open will determine how long the camera sensor is exposed to light. So what does this mean? Well, a faster shutter speed exposes the camera sensor to less light, and a slower shutter speed exposes the camera sensor to more light. Again, makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Talking of making perfect sense, ISO. ISO is the, well, these days, the baffling, irrelevant three-letter description for the sensitivity of a camera sensor to light. Forget the history, this is the important bit. The lower the ISO number, the less sensitive the camera sensor is to light. The higher the ISO number, the more sensitive the camera sensor is to light. What does this mean in English then? Well, simply, if you take a photo with a low ISO, say 100, if you then change the ISO to say 400, the camera sensor is more sensitive to light and the less light that is needed to give the correct exposure. I'm going to reword that last. I'm going to reword this one because that wasn't very good, was it? If you take a photo with a low ISO, say 100, if you then change the ISO to say 400, the camera sensor is more sensitive to light, so less light is needed to get the same correct exposure. And what you'd do to do that is, and I haven't written this in the script, so I'm going to outlive this now and try and get it right. If you change the ISO from 100 to 400, you need less light, so what you do is use a shorter shutter speed, less time, or a smaller aperture, as in less light. And that's how the three bits work together, and this is a fundamental point of how a camera works. Okay, so let's keep to the point of how does a camera work, and how do you work a camera? Well, these settings, you can, you can use a manual mode, or an automatic mode, or even a semi-automatic mode. So the camera, it'll allow you to set the three things manually, or it can do it for you. Or you can set two of these and it will sort the other one out for you. But this is definitely stuff for another episode here. I'm, I'm trying to stick to how a camera works without going off on digressions all over the place, which, which is difficult. Where are the photos stored? Well, cameras have memory card slots. You insert a memory card into the camera, and this is what the photos are stored on. You then take the memory card out of the camera and import the photos to a computer. This is the very old school traditional way of doing stuff and this is how I still work. Tripod thread. Well, I just wanted to mention this, the tripod thread thing. On the bottom of the camera is a thread which you can attach a mounting plate to and then attach your camera to a tripod. These threads are all the same size by the way, so once you've got the plate it will fit on any tripod thread. I'm pretty sure it's every camera. Why would you do this? Well, that's another one for another episode. In fact, I've covered tripods in previous episodes. So just check out the, the website, photographyexplainedpodcast.com, where you can see all the good stuff I've spoken about so far. Batteries. Well, one last thing. Yep, camera batteries. You need these to make your camera work, obviously. All cameras these days use rechargeable batteries, thankfully. And um, all the other good stuff. Well, there's lots of other good stuff in cameras, which I couldn't possibly cover all in one episode. And every camera manufacturer has different things and different ways of doing things. But the stuff I've told you about here applies to cameras in general. So I couldn't explain in a half hour episode all the things that make a Canon 6D worse, because there's far too many of them. Okay, let's move on to what if I use a phone and not a camera to take my photos? Well, a phone is a device that you can use to take photos. A phone has a camera lens, it has a sensor, it has an aperture, and it's got everything else all built into the phone. But the basic principles, they still apply with a phone just as equally as they do with a a camera. So you compose, focus, take a photo. It's, It's the same thing, isn't it? There's no difference. So if anybody looks down on someone for taking photos with a phone, they're wrong. That's my opinion. You don't get all the adjustments and stuff that you can do with the camera. And that is, that's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. And it depends entirely on you and what you're trying to get out of your photography. It's a good thing because all you've got is your phone. So it's nice and simple. But it's bad because you don't have all the other adjustments and stuff that we photographers get with cameras. And like I say, that can be seen as good. And that can be seen as bad. And I reckon there's a there's a whole generation of people who've got into photography using phones who are looking at a lot of this stuff that we have on cameras and thinking why why do i need all that stuff i've got this phone that takes amazing photos why do i need all that stuff 
Well, it's a fair point, isn't it? And there will come a time when you won't need all that other stuff, but we're not there yet. And all this other stuff that we have in cameras with the lenses and everything, it sets us apart from people who take photos with phones. Not that you can't take great photos with phones, it's just that with a camera and the ecosystems around cameras, it gives you more opportunities to take better photos, that's all. No guarantees. Take photos of the phone, absolutely fine and valid, but you've got the opportunity to take better, more interesting, more varied photos with a camera and all that comes with it. I hope that made sense. <laughs> what do I do? Well, I use all of the above. Of course I do. I use a camera to take my photos and I have a small number of camera lenses that I use. And my camera lenses are specific to the photography that I do, which is mainly architectural photography, construction photography, real estate photography. Quick plug here, check out my website, rickmacavoyphotography.com, where you can see all my own stuff. And I know my camera inside out. And this is the thing I wanted to touch on here. See, I've learned my camera inside out. I, I really have. I, I've spent time and I've practiced and learned how to use my camera. I've sat down with my camera and my manual and some time and gone through the manual with the camera and tried everything. Yes, I've really done it. But in doing this, I found things I'd never have known about and I managed to turn off things that I didn't want my camera to do automatically. So I recommend, I very strongly recommend, sorry, that everybody does that with the camera. You spend a lot of money on a camera, don't you? So why wouldn't you learn how to use it properly and get it set up so it works for you? See, there's a lot of things that you can change in a camera. There are settings you can change for every photo that you take. And there are settings that you make once and never go back to. I had some auto-correcting stuff set on the Canon 6D that I didn't want it to do. And I didn't know it was doing it until I looked into it. But you need to know what these camera settings are. And you need to make sure that you set your camera up to work for you. So, I mean, how does a camera work? Well, out of the box, how the manufacturer has set it up. But this might not be right for you. It wasn't for me. So to get your camera to work properly for you, you have some work to do. How does my camera work for me? Well, these are the things that I have set, which I use all the time. AV mode, ISO 100, aperture, F8, shutter speed, worked out by the camera. Raw image capture, camera on a tripod, self timer on, auto bracketing on. Yeah, see there's much. <laughs> see, there's so much to this, isn't there? These are just the headline settings that I use. And auto bracketing gets a mention for the first time right here. Very quickly, I use auto bracketing, and this is where the camera takes three photos at the same time, but with different exposures. I merge them together in Lightroom later to create one image to work on with more of the lights and darks than I would get with a single image capture. So your camera works how you tell it to work. So make sure your camera is working to the best for you for the photos that you take. Right, I think I'm done with that lot. Some thoughts from the last episode. 11 actionable things you and I can do to improve our photography in 2023, part two. I don't, I don't want to go on about this too much. I think I have done, but I will, I will a little bit. All right. See, one of my favorite sayings is this. Um, you might have heard this before. If you haven't, if you're new to my podcast, you'll hear this more than once, believe me. And I just said, believe me, then I stopped saying that because... It's bad for me to say believe me because that's implying that if I don't say believe me, I'm telling you a pack of lies. <laughs> I thought I was over that, but clearly not. Here we go. The number one way for you and me to improve our photography is to go out more to take photos. And I'm going to add to that. The number one way for you and me to improve our photography is to go out more to take photos, but take less photos. Yep. Go out more, but take less photos. Quality over quantity. Think about the photos that you're taking when you're taking them. Right, that's that. Enough said. Next episode. Well, I'm through 150 now, aren't I? Which I'm still, um, I'm still surprised. I mean, it's been, it's been on the cards, hasn't it? <laughs> Every episode's been getting me one closer, but now I've got here. I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised, but really pleased as well. So, episode 151. How do I take the best photos that I can with my camera? Well, this is the logical next episode, isn't it? Where I take what I've told you about here and tell you how to take the best photos that you can with your camera. And I know that there's loads of other stuff about how a camera works that I could have told you, but I have to stop somewhere. And I didn't, I didn't go on about focal length, did I? Or zooming or focusing or good stuff like that. But I'll pick up on some of that in the, um, in the next episode, okay? Right, some things I would like you to do to help me. 
Firstly, if you've got a photography question you want me to answer in plain English in less than 27 minutes-ish, but still without the relevant details, just head over to photographyexplainedpodcast.com forward slash start, and you can find out there what to do. You can just say hi if you want. That's absolutely fine. It'd be lovely to hear from you either way. And now my small favour of you. If you enjoyed this episode, please write a nice review on your podcast provider of choice. And also, why not post it on your social feeds? And why not follow my podcast to make sure you get the next episode when it is released, which is, as I badly described last episode, 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon here in England, whatever time zone that is. Okay, one last thing. <laughs> I've, I've forgotten to take this bit out of my notes. One last thing, I've enjoyed these two episodes. I hope that you did too. These are things that I've... No, you see, I didn't. I needed to get rid of that. But the one thing I did want to pick out of that was, um, if you've... If you've done stuff based on the last two episodes, which was the 11 things to, you know, that kind of thing. If you've done something from those 11 things, or if you've got things that you want me to add to my list of 11 things that we can do to improve our photography, get in touch, let me know what they are. I'd love to, um, I'd love to come back to this one with what everybody else is thinking about and doing. Get in touch, be great to hear from you. Okay, that's all. Well, this episode was brought to you by... um. Well, me breakfast as I'm recording this one in the morning, which is most unusual. It's it's good to get it's good to get it done earlier on in the day. So no no cheese and pickle sandwich and bag of salt and vinegar crisps involved in the making of this episode washed down with a diet Pepsi. No, that'll be in a bit. No, I just had a nice coffee before I settled down in my homemade acoustically cushioned recording emporium. And when I say acoustically cushioned, I mean with cushions and pillows and I've got a new cushioning arrangement which is which is a another less but more thing which is working a treat now which is a lot less restricted because I used to put a big uh, fleecy blanket on the window which kept on hanging down and dropping around and getting in the wear stuff but now two pillows two cushions and job done that's enough cushion talk isn't it I've been Rick McAvoy thanks again very much for listening to my small but perfectly formed podcast it says here and for giving me 27-ish minutes of your valuable time. Yep, I think that this episode will be 27, 28 minutes, which is nice. So, I'm done. Take care, stay safe. Cheers from me, Rick.